Circle of Hope Network, doing life and being church together. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm glad there's snow here. I really am. It, it reminds me of uh, past lives working in British Columbia, my first four years of ministry in British Columbia, and then uh, three in Alberta. And it was, uh, I, I'll confess to you, I, I wasn't ready for Alberta. Uh, British Columbia has the, the, the wet snow every once in a while, you know, on the coast and everything. And, um, I wasn't ready for Alberta. It got to the point where like two weeks out of the year, I would walk out of my house and I'd just be angry. <laughs> the, the, the 40 below would hit me and I'd just be angry. And I would think people have been living here for who knows how many hundreds of years and they just, they, they stay living here and, and, and I'm angry. Why am I so angry? And, and I'd talk to my wife about it, and, 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 and she said, well, it's just, it's just too cold. <laughs> and, and, but you know, we got over it, and I learned to dress for the, for the occasion, and I would walk to, to the office and everything every time I'd have to get out of the house, and it, it turned out that we really enjoyed it. So, yeah, I'm glad to be here in Saskatchewan. I wanted to talk to you uh, tonight a little bit about uh, what saves you, if I could. So let's start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, uh, you're good so much better than we deserve and um, you love us uh, for who we are and sometimes in spite of who we are and uh, your saving grace is more powerful than sometimes we even give you credit for it to be so tonight help us to realize some things about your good good character in jesus name amen, amen. So I was uh, driving in Santa Rosa, California, which is just about 45 minutes from where I live. And, and it's, uh, where I live is all forested and, and uh, um, there's just nothing there except for the college really and that's it. And we're up on this hill and there's 2,500 people that live there and, and it's kind of secluded. If I wanted to go to like a fast food restaurant, I'd have to drive 40 minutes, 45 minutes to get to one. So we're kind of out there a little bit. And I had some business to do. And uh, I was actually, I got a gift certificate to this men's suit shop and I was going to go buy, the only thing you can afford there for $50 is socks. So I was going to buy some socks. And, uh, and so I didn't quite know where it was. And so I pulled off of an exit and I got my phone out and I was asking the little lady in my phone where this place was. And as I was doing that, and this was probably May, and it was a really warm May, so it had to be approaching 100 degrees Fahrenheit there. And, and so I'm uh, on the side of the road, and my air conditioning's cranking, and, and all of a sudden, as I'm sitting there waiting to get these directions on my phone, I hear flap, bap, 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 bap. And I look in my rearview mirror, and I see it, that the car on, the, on the, uh, one of the driver's side as it's coming by, I could see it as it was, as soon as I, I heard it was very loud, um, I could see there was a flat tire. So this car uh, comes screaming by me and then lands, I don't know, uh, 50 yards in front of me, maybe 25 yards in front of me, and, and uh, 25 meters in front of me. And uh, I'm sitting there and I'm watching, I think, well, huh, I wonder who's in the car and how they're going to do with the flat tire. And I'm sitting in my car, air conditioning's feeling very good, and uh, I see two young ladies get out of the car. And uh, um, one of them is, uh, uh, has uh, like a, uh, a thin t-shirt, uh, a tank top kind of a thing on, and, and, and shorts, and, and uh, she's, uh, she looks like she's been around the world a few times. And, and uh, the other girl was younger, she looked to be 14 or 15 years old. And I see them come around to the back of the car and they open the trunk up and it's filled, just packed with clothing. So they start taking clothes out and putting them on the pavement right there on the, on the side of the car. And they finally get all the clothes out and there was a mountain of them that they had shoved in there. And they get the jack out and I see them standing there and looking at each other and they're looking at this jack and they're shrugging their shoulders and, and I thought, okay, I need to man up and get out of my air conditioned car and go and 
help them change this tire. And, and so I pulled up behind them and, and got out of my car. And I said, hello, ladies, uh, is there anything I can do to help you? And uh, the 14-year-old girl turns around, she looks up at me and goes, yeah, no, we don't need your help. I said, oh, um, okay. And the older lady that, again, looked like, like she'd had experience in life, I'll just leave that description there. Um, she looked at me and, and, and she said, we could really use your help. And I said, okay, do you not know how to change a tire? And she said, no. And, and I said, well, let me help you. So I got the jack all set and I went around to, it was the, now that I'm thinking of it, the back uh, driver's side tire. And there was a window down in back. Uh, the car was running, but there was no air conditioning in that car. It was broken. And there was a little boy in a car seat sitting in back. He had both ears pierced and, and he was sitting back there and he looked to be two years old or so. And uh, I said, hi, what's your name? And the 14 year old girl again snapped at me and she said, uh, don't talk to him. Okay, I won't. And then the older lady said, his name's Jamal. I said, hi, Jamal. And Jamal gave me kind of a grin, but he was all sweaty, it was very warm. And so I thought I better get this thing changed so they can get into some air conditioning. So I got the car, uh, got the, the lug nuts loose, jacked it up and, and uh, got the tire off. I said, okay, where's your spare? And, and we ran around behind and I got her spare. And I looked at the spare tire and the spare tire needed a spare tire. It was, it was bald, there was some belt showing, but it was holding air. But I'm pretty sure um, within five miles, the thing would just go, <laughs> you know. And, and so I said, this is it, this is what you got? And she goes, uh, yeah, that's, that's all I can afford. I said, okay, all right. And, and so I put it on there and, and it was a full size spare. And uh, so I looked at her other tires and they were just in really, really bad shape. And uh, I said, well, you need to get a spare tire right away for the one that just broke. Uh, and you gotta do that now. And she goes, okay, well, I think I know somebody. I said, okay. And uh, I said, can I follow you to where this place is? And she said, well, yeah, yeah, okay, you can follow me. I said, I just don't want you to get another, and then you know, you're gonna be in a world of hurt. So then I, I, I'd feel more comfortable if I could follow you. You can follow me. Okay, 14 year old girl just eyeing me. So they get in the car and I, and, and I follow them into a, a part of town that I had never personally been before. And, uh, and down this alley uh, between these uh, stores, uh, down this dirt road alley, and there's this big like old shed, kind of a barn looking thing with tires piled all over the place. And this old guy comes limping out and she starts talking to him and then they start arguing. I could see with their body language and I put my window down so I could hear. And he's trying to charge her 60 bucks for this ratty old used tire. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, you know, this, this is not right. And, and so I get out of the car and I start walking toward him and he looks at me and who dat? <laughs> he says, <laughs> and I said, hey, uh, I, I was just somebody that saw her get the flat tire. I want to make sure that she gets a good tire. And he starts yelling at me, why don't you get out of here? I'm doing business and everything. And, and I'm looking at her tires. I'm looking at what she's trying to buy for 60 bucks, which she clearly doesn't have. And, and I'm thinking, whoa. I looked at her and I said, listen, don't buy that tire. And this guy goes, what are you talking about? Don't buy my tire. You're getting in our business. I said, please don't buy that tire until I make a phone call and, and, I, and I come back and talk to you. And she goes, okay. And he's yelling at me and he's yelling at her and I go back into the car and I'm just feeling really, really convicted. And uh, I also am feeling like my bank account isn't feeling convicted because <laughs> because I just you know I don't make a lot of money and and so uh, I got on my phone and and I called my wife and I said listen and I told her the situation I said I really feel like Jesus is telling you and me to buy this lady a set of tires 
And my wife said, are you feeling like the Holy Spirit's just telling you that? And I said, I really do. I feel really like the Holy Spirit wants me. And she said, is the Holy Spirit reminding you of what's in our bank account? <laughs> and I, I said, yes, Holy Spirit has also reminded me of that. But Holy Spirit also reminded me that we have three credit cards and there's not a cent owing on any of them. And, and we don't like using credit, and, but we own the cards. And, and I said, I, I feel like, you know, we can pay it off in, in, in two or three months. And uh, she said, you know what? Do what Holy Spirit says to do. So I get out of the car and, and I start, you know, they're finagling again. And I said, don't buy that tire. Don't buy that tire. And, and, and he, I'm, I was much bigger than him. And, uh, and, and I'm not an aggressive person, but I walked up close and, and, and said, you know, back off. And, and I said, listen, would you trust me? And she looked up at me, and she looked over at the car, and the 14-year-old girl's going. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, would you just trust me? And she said, uh, yeah, mister, I'll trust you. I said, follow me. Get in your car and follow me. We went about three miles, and we pulled into a, uh, it's called America's Tire. It's a discount tire place, but it has the same tires as everybody else. They just have the word discount, and they all cost the same, too. Anyway, <laughs> it's at a discount, I guess, because it says so. So we pull in, and uh, I get out of the car, and I said, could you wait in the car here for me for a minute? And she said, okay, mister, I'll wait in the car. And I walked in, and uh, the, I asked for the manager, and, and I said, listen, we've got a situation here. And the situation is this, and I pointed out at the car, and it's a ratty looking car, but it seemed like it was running okay, just had tires. I said, how much for a set of tires for that car? And he gets on his computer. He said, I get you a good set of tires for 800 bucks. I said, uh, okay, uh, is there anything less than good that would be new that we could... <laughs> Well, no, 800 bucks is actually our cheapest. And I said, okay, listen, um, what's the next one up? And it was like $940 or something like that. And uh, I said, would you consider a discount for what's going on here? And he looks at me and, and he says, no, I, I won't consider a discount. If you want to buy the tires, you can buy the tires. I'm like, ah, okay. Um, so I said, let's make it happen. So they get to the, uh, start getting their end going, and I walk out and I ask her to come in with me. And she comes in, and, and I said, Listen, it's air conditioned in there. I said, I need you to know something. Um, I need you to know that Jesus told me to buy you a new set of tires for your car. She goes, You mean a spare? I said, No, not a spare, a new set of tires. And she looks at me and she steps back and she said, why, why are you doing this? And I said, because I think Jesus wants me to. I said, believe me, I can't afford it. <laughs> I think Jesus wants me to. And she looks at me and she goes, what do you want? I said, nothing. And she said, why are you doing this? I said, I just kept saying it because Jesus wants me to. And then all of a sudden she kind of realizes that this is actually going to happen. And she starts to weep. And she starts to yell happy noises. And she runs across the little lobby thing where the, everybody was standing. And she runs and she jumps with her arms and legs out and wraps her arms around my neck and her legs around my torso. This was the most uncomfortable hug I have ever had in my whole <laughs> life. And she's just screaming, thank you, thank you, thank you, oh, thank you. Uh, the little girl comes running in, what's going on? She sees this going on, you know. He's buying us tires. And then she softened up, thank you, mister. Th why are you doing it? Because Jesus told me to. Got her tires uh, while we were sitting there and waiting. Uh, told me that she just got a job at a Safeway store deli, a grocery store deli, and that she was hoping to get enough money so that they didn't have to live in their car and keep their laundry in the trunk anymore. 
And, uh, and, and so uh, I said, when's payday? And she goes, it's actually coming up. I think, I think I can even get an advance. And I think today we can get a place. We've got a place we were going to go look at. That's where we we're on our way to and, and everything. I said, well, praise the Lord for that, that you've got a place to live for you and your, your little boy. What happened there is the biblical definition of justice. Now, most people think that justice is when you get what you deserve, right? But according to the Bible, that's not justice. In, in the Old Testament especially, justice is when you make a wrong thing right. Justice is when you see poverty and you alleviate the poverty. Justice is when you see somebody sick and you help make them well. Justice is, see, is when you see something is going wrong in the world and your influence makes it right. That's what justice is. And God is all about justice. He's all about justice. He's all about making wrong things right. And you know this because when Jesus came to earth, right, what did he do? He made wrong things right. He even declared it in Luke when he stands up in, uh, in Nazareth for Sabbath school and he gets the scroll of Isaiah. What does he read? I have come to set prisoners free and to, to set captives free, right? To make blind people see and to make lame people walk. I've come to do justice. The church isn't doing it. So I need to show you how. Our God is a God of justice. And justice is a wonderful attribute. But justice is not what saves you. Uh, my, one of my best friends and I had just got done preaching at uh, the uh, uh, Alberta camp meeting. And, and we had to get in my car and we had to go back to seminary. So to do that, we dropped down through... What are the towns in Alberta that you draw, that you go down to, to get into Montana? Lethbridge? Is that one of them, maybe? Yeah, yeah. And we got into Montana, and I said, do you want to stop? He goes, let's just drive all night. We are having such a great time. Both of us in seminary, um, Bible open where the emergency break is, and we were solving every problem in the world. Do you know how you can do that with a long trip with friends? Um, I, I was telling Dave that the one time that I've driven to, to Saskatoon, was from Alberta, and I had two students in the car with me. I was going to drop them off here, and then I was going to go and speak at a camp somewhere. And so we were coming into Saskatoon, and we were talking and laughing, and at one point I realized that, and I said, wait, 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 wait. I haven't turned in like a half an hour. <laughs> We've just been going straight for half an hour. This is so cool. You know, I've never seen that many straight roads in my life. And... Uh, and so we were going, and, and, uh, and I got a little tired. I said, well, let's switch, and he, we switched up. And I had, uh, in my vehicle, I had a radar detector, and, uh, and, and we were driving a little a Nissan Maxima, and, and, and we were going along, and my radar detector, it's going beep, beep, beep. It was getting obnoxious, because we were out in the middle of nowhere. There's, there's just nothing out there, so we didn't know why it was malfunctioning, so I just turned it down. I didn't turn it off. And we're going along, and, 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 and we're just flying down the road, and we're talking, and we're solving political issues in the United States. We're, we're, we, we've got, we've got um, all the biblical uh, mysteries of the world are all figured out. It's just great. We're having a great time. When all of a sudden we see in the reflection of the mirrors those terrifying blue and red lights. And I look in the rearview mirror, and I see it's a policeman. I look at the radar detector. It's pegged on red. And I look at the speedometer, and Alex is driving. By the way, Alex Bryan is the uh, senior pastor at Walla Walla College Church, the Walla Walla University Church now. Um, Alex was driving. I looked at the speedometer, and it said 105 miles per hour. <laughs> Two in the morning, Montana. This uh, policeman comes over and flashlight taps on the window and Alex rolls down the window, smiling. Big old policeman. He leans down, looks in the window, and he sees us both there smiling. <laughs> Where are you boys going in such a hurry? And I'm thinking in my brain, we're going into a jail in Montana and we will never be seen again. They make movies out of stuff like this. 
in a moment of either divine inspiration or sheer stupidity, Alex looks down and sees that Bible sitting in between us, and he grabs the Bible, and he turns around, and he puts it out the window, and he says, Officer, we are just two ministers of the gospel driving back to seminary so we can learn how to bring good news to the world. <laughs> and I thought, you idiot. What did you just say? And the officer is there, and he's looking, and he takes that in, and all of a sudden he goes, ah! <laughs> He's slapping his knee. Oh, boy, he says, I've been on this beat for 20 years. I have never heard a better one than that. <laughs> he says, now, I don't know if it's true or not true that you guys are both ministers of the gospel going to seminary, but the story's so good, I'm going to let you boys go. He says, he says, now, listen, keep it down to about 85 for me, would you? Like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Watch out for deer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we sped off. What happened there is mercy. Mercy is when you deserve to get something punishment. You deserve to get smacked around a little bit. You deserve to go to a Montana jail. But instead, you get let off. And boy, we love mercy, don't we? Especially when it happens to us. When we blow it and somebody cuts us a break, man, that is the best, the best, the best. Oh, Jesus was really, really good at mercy. In John chapter 8, Jesus is teaching in the temple and everybody's all gathered around. Got little children. I love how Ellen White describes how the little children would sit on Jesus' lap and they would, they would lay their head right there on his chest and fall asleep while he was teaching. And he'd, he'd be holding kids. Man, what a great picture of Jesus. That's as manly as Jesus gets right there. Just being that kind of guy. And he's telling stories about the kingdom of God and people are ooing and aahing and they just want to hear more and more and more when all of a sudden in the back there's this ruckus and, and people start turning around to see what all the noise and clamor is about. And as they look, they see very, very angry, upset men. Veins in their foreheads, bloodshot eyes. They're just grinding their teeth with anger. And they are dragging this woman who's trying her best to keep what blanket she has around her, around her. And they're dragging her by the hair and by her arms, and she's screaming, and, and the crowd parts like the Red Sea, and they bring her right up the middle aisle, and they throw her at Jesus' feet. Now, they have a very warped idea of what justice is. They think justice is when you get what you deserve. So they demand justice. The law says, and the law does say this, she has to die. We throw stones at her until she dies. That's what the law says, Jesus. Are you a Jew? Are you a man of the law? Do you believe in the law? The law says she dies. What say you, Jesus? I love what Jesus does here. You know, every time God puts his hands in dirt, something cool happens. First time he gets a bunch of dirt and he organizes it and he pneumas into the, into the dirt and it becomes a living thing. Another time he puts his hands in dirt, Moses carries it down that's the very character of God on tablets, right? Every time God puts his hands in dirt, something cool happens. Jesus kneels down and he starts writing in the dirt. Hey, uh, Barnabas, you were with her last Tuesday night. Barnabas drops his rock and walks on. Jesus writes something else. Nathaniel. You're the one that got her started in this in the first place. Nathaniel drops his rock and walks out. Fred, I don't know any other biblical names. Fred, <laughs> you 
Just writes in the dirt. That's all he does. He writes in the dirt. Then he stands up. All the smart old guys are gone because they know what's going on. All the young dumb ones are there with their rocks. If you're without sin, throw a rock. World's first rock concert. <laughs> they all just keep hitting the ground. <laughs> they all walk away. Woman isn't looking up. She knows what's coming. She's ready. All her life she knew it was going to happen. At some point, somebody was going to do something. She'd been beaten up plenty. Never been accepted. Jesus kneels down and lifts her chin up so that their eyes can meet. Men have beat her up pretty good all her life. Why should she trust this one? Your accusers are gone. I'm not going to accuse you of anything. I'm not going to condemn you. Now, you can't be a prostitute anymore. People think go and sin no more is that Jesus was telling her to go and be sinless. Have you ever tried to be sinless? It's really hard. <laughs> he was telling her, you can't be a prostitute anymore. Some people think, we don't know for sure, but some people think that this woman could have been named Mary, who lived just over the hill in Bethany, just not very far away. And that this could have been the very first evangelist after Christ's death and resurrection that went to tell the disciples that he was alive. What happened in this story um, we call mercy. Mercy, again, is when you deserve something. Hey, the law said you got to die, and she doesn't die. Mercy is an attribute of God. All through the Psalms, oh, our, we have a God of mercy. He's a merciful God, right? We love that our God, our God is a God of mercy because there's plenty of times when we should have got spanked when we didn't. When God said, listen, okay, Go and sin no more, but man, dude, you, 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 come on, I'm not going to condemn you here. Right? Our God is a God of mercy. Mercy is a great quality. But mercy is also not what saves us. One of my best friends in the world is a guy named Mark Hilarities. Mark is a cancer research chemist. He, I tell him he kills rats for a living, but uh, he actually has done things to make it so that uh, cancer treatments are better and better and better. And he works for Fred Hutchison uh, Cancer Institute in Seattle. And Mark and I were on a, on a mission trip once, and we were in Mexico. Actually, we were with CUC students on a mission trip to Mexico. Uh, that was when I was chaplain at CUC. And uh, we were down there, and, and it was freezing cold. We were up in the mountains. You think Mexico, you're going to be you know, doing mission work and tanning. Um, but it was just freezing. There was snow on the ground and everything. So we're sitting around the fire, and I'm sitting next to Mark. And I said, Mark, how would you become a Christian? And he said, oh, man, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. I said, we got all night. <laughs> Tell me, how would you become a Christian? He said, okay. He said, I was in, uh, my, getting my Ph.D., in New Mexico, and my family lived in Michigan. It was Christmas break, and so I drove all the way across the United States up into Michigan to be there for Christmas break. And on Christmas Eve, instead of being with my family, I chose to go out to a bar and be drinking with my friends. I said, okay. I said, I didn't know you drank. And he goes, well, I used to. I said, okay. I said, you don't anymore, right? He goes, no, no, no. I said, okay, so, so tell me what happened. He says, well, we just got, all of us got way drunk. Oh, we just got wasted. And he said, we were just, we were just to the point where, where somebody was going to have to drag us out of there. And the guy behind the counter said, listen, you guys, I want to go home to my family. It's Christmas Eve. Get out of here. And he chased us all out. So we're all staggering to our cars. And he says, I staggered to my car. He says, I know I must have dropped my keys three times. And I picked them up and it was cold up there in, in, in uh, Northern Michigan. And, and, and he finally got into his car, got it started and, and, pulled back and then put it in drive and he went to the curb and he looked both ways to see if anybody was coming. Nobody coming. He pulls out to go left across the road 
and gets T-boned by a brand spanking new Lincoln Continental. T-bones him. Smash! Uh, Mark, being the drunk guy, doesn't get hurt. <laughs> happens sometimes. And uh, he gets out of his car, and as he's confused, and he's dazed, and there's, there's smoke, and, and light's kind of weird, and, and everything. And his friends came, they got out of their cars, and they come running over, and the guy from the Continental gets out, and he's got a split lip, and blood is gushing down his chin. And he runs over, and he goes, are you okay, are you okay? And Mark's like, yeah, okay. And the guy says, oh, no, he says, you're drunk. Yeah, I've, I've been drinking. Well, let's, let's push this car off the road before somebody, and so they push both cars into the parking lot. And it's, even in Mark's drunken state, he starts to realize the deep weeds that he's in. And he starts to get uh, uh, drunk emotional. I don't know if you've been around enough drunk people to know what drunk emotional is, but he got drunk emotional, and he's, oh no, what's gonna happen to me? And he calls his dad, and his dad is just, angry. His dad is just ticked. How dare you ruin our Christmas like this? How dare you ruin your education like this? I'll be out there, but don't expect any mercy from me. And, and uh, he hangs up and, and he looks at the guy with the split lip and he's got a rag on it now that the bartender gave him. And, and uh, he says, what's going to happen? And he looks at Mark and he looks at the state that he's in and he looks at the cars out the window and he says, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to call the police. Oh, thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. And, and, uh, and funny, in, in retrospect, Mark says, yeah, you probably should have called the police. But uh, he says, I'm not going to call the police. He says, it looks like you're already in enough trouble. Mark's dad shows up, and he is just angry. He's yelling and screaming at Mark. And then he turns to the guy, and he says, I am so sorry for my idiot son who pulled out in front of you. you know, that kind of a dad. And, and it was true, Mark was an idiot son at the time. And uh, so, so, <laughs> so uh, they exchange information, and the guy says, listen, I'm going to call you the day after Christmas if I can, and, 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 and then we'll get together and we'll make things right. Brand new Lincoln Continental, making things right was going to mean that Mark was going to just have to work for a few years and not get his PhD. That's just what it meant. So Christmas happens. Everybody in Mark's family is so angry at him, he gets zero Christmas presents. <laughs> they don't give him anything, you know. You deserve what you get, and you get nothing. And, and uh, so they're all opening presents, and he's sitting in the corner all hungover and, and, and knowing that he's just blown his whole career and, and uh, lucky that he's not in jail. Day after Christmas, they get a phone call right around lunchtime, just before lunch. Hey, uh, um, give him a dress in Holland, Michigan. Can you, can you come to Holland, uh, Michigan, and, and uh, can you find this address? This is before the days you could just tell the little lady in your phone what you know, to do. And, and, and uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, we know where that is. We think, well, we can find it. So they get in the car. Well, we're probably going to this guy's house, and he's probably going to give us a bill for whatever new Lincoln Continental costs. They pull to the address. And it's not a guy's house, it's a car dealership. <laughs> Mark and his dad get out and go, he's gonna make us buy him a new car today. This is crazy, I can't afford to do this. And he looks around and he sees this guy stitched up on his lips now, gruesome, standing in front of the same model of car that Mark was driving only two years newer, with way less miles, and in really good shape. Mark looks at this, and he walks toward the guy, and he goes, what are you doing? And the guy has some papers in his hands, and he says, uh, listen, uh, I bought you this car. Merry Christmas. And Mark, like all of us do with grace, goes, Whoa, 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 whoa. You can't just give me that. And the guy goes, why? Because I'm the drunk guy. I'm the idiot that pulled in front of you. I'm the guy that blew it and screwed up. You didn't do anything. I don't deserve that. 
And the guy with the papers walks toward Mark and he goes, I know. Here, Merry Christmas. And now Mark's dad is getting suspicious. <laughs> and he says, hey, hey, what, 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 the, the, what are the strings attached here? I mean, what, what are you expecting from us? And the guy said, nothing. I want to give you this car. And again, Mark said, no, there's got to be a string attached. And the guy says, fine, okay, there's one string attached. And Mark's dad goes, aha. Mm -hmm. What do you want from us? And the guy looks at him and says, there's a diner around the corner. Would you allow me to take you both out to lunch? Uh, uh, okay. They go around the corner, they sit in the dinette. Well, table, order their food, and Mark and his dad are looking at each other, and the guy's sitting across from them with a split lip, they're thinking, man, it's going to be hard to eat. <laughs> he goes, Mark's dad again, what's going on here? The guy says, okay, listen, I'm going to tell you what's going on. I was married to the most beautiful woman that's ever lived. And several Christmases back, she passed away. She died of cancer. And it happened right during Christmas. And in her honor, every Christmas, I've decided I'm going to do something unexpectedly nice for somebody. Every Christmas, I've done that. He said, it was so weird. This Christmas, I didn't have anybody. And then I ran into you. Mark kind of hung his head, <laughs> he says. So, in honor of my wife, Merry Christmas. Mark's starting to now get a little bit choked up. And the guy says, Mark, are you a believer? Mark's family went to church uh, two times a year, Christmas and Easter, Reformed Church. And he said, uh, like in Jesus? Yeah, like in Jesus. Um, I guess not. Mark, what's happening here is what Jesus does for people. He offers us grace. And this is an illustration of grace. Mark, right now, you can have the universe. You can have eternal life. You can have a new life here on earth that'll just change the way you do things if you want. That's all you have to do is accept Jesus into your heart. Give him all your garbage and he'll give you a crown. Mark, would you like to be a follower of Jesus? And Mark's dad answers and goes, yeah, we want that. <laughs> we want that. And Mark says, yeah, I... I want that. I, I want that. Guy reaches his hands across the table. He says, can I hold you guys' hand and lead you in a prayer? Yeah. They reached across the table and they all grabbed hands. And this man led Mark and his dad in a prayer that dedicated their lives to Jesus, asked forgiveness for their sins, and asked for a new life here on this earth before they get to the next one. Amen, amen, amen. Guy said, listen, I'm going to check up on you guys. I want you to get into a church. And this wasn't an Adventist church. It was, a, he says, but there's several churches around here. I'll give you a list if you want. And, well, we have a pretty good church. And they had a decent church. They just never went. Mark started going to church, gave his heart to Christ. And later on the line, uh, came an Adventist. And I got to meet him and, and be his really good friend. Justice is great, and that's a great attribute of God, and I'm glad our God is a God of justice. Mercy. Whew, man, when I deserve bad things and somebody cuts me a break, doesn't convict me when I should be convicted, I love mercy, and I love that our God is a God of mercy, but mercy isn't what saves us either. In Ephesians 2, it says, For it is by grace that you have been saved. Not by your own works, lest any man boast. It's been grace that has saved you. 
Grace is when we give God all of our ugliness and he exchanges it for a crown. Because even the best we have to offer, the Bible says, is filthy rags. And I'm not going to go into the whole description of what that means in the Hebrew, filthy rags, but it's really filthy. The best we have to offer, the best we have to offer is filthy rags. And God takes our filthy rags and he takes our ugliness too and, and he gives us a crown. That's grace. Undeserved, unmerited, he offers it to us. In fact, in Ephesians 1, it says he chooses us to be on his team before the foundation of the world born in his good graces and in his embrace. And it's only when we say, I want my junk back and you leave me alone that we forfeit that. That's what grace is. And it's offered to us in abundance. And when we accept it and live in that grace, we are more manly than any other thing that we can do. Grace is what saves us.